Welcome to the Library Love Fest podcast. I'm Virginia Stanley. I'm Lainey Mays. And I'm Grace Catanolo. We are the library marketing team at HarperCollins Publishers. We bring librarians and great books together. The new year brings new offerings from our podcast. The first episode of the month will have book presentations, author interviews, voicemails from librarians like you, and more. And our mini episode halfway through the month features our Library Reads winners. Don't miss our winning author's acceptance speeches. Welcome and enjoy the show. Book Buzz, HarperCollins Book Buzz. Check it out. Book Buzz, HarperCollins Book Buzz. Brought to you by Library Love Fest. Welcome. Today, I'm here to interview Aisha Harris about her new pop culture filled delight of a book, Wannabe. Hi, Aisha. Hey, Lainey. Thanks for having me. Of course. So, thank you for being here. I've been talking nonstop about your book to any librarian who will listen to me. So, I think this is a <laughs> fun you. conversation. Um, so, I'm going <laughs> to talk a little bit about you before we get into some questions and more about the book. So, a little bio. Well, I say little, there's quite a bit here, but it's uh, I'll do it quickly. Aisha Harris is the co-host of the popular NPR podcast, Pop Culture Happy Hour. From 2012 to 2018, she covered culture for Slate Magazine as a staff writer, editor, and host of the film and television podcast, Represent. She joined the New York Times in 2018 as the assistant television editor on the Culture Desk and became culture editor for the Opinion Desk, where she wrote and edited a variety of pieces on the arts, society, and politics. Born and raised in Connecticut, she earned her bachelor's degree in theater from Northwestern University and her master's degree in cinema studies from New York University. She lives in Oakland, California, and this is her first book, uh, Wannabe, which mm. comes out June 13th. Oh. <laughs> How is it writing the first book? Oh, well, very, very stressful. <laughs> and I, I, I don't know if I recommend it. Um, it's <laughs> it was uh, I give it maybe one and a half stars out of five. Um, no, I, I find the process of writing very, very tedious, which is, you know, ironic because I I am a writer and that that was in many ways my first one of my first loves as a kid. Um, but it, it's 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 difficult and challenging and it took me a very long time to write this book and I'm glad it's finally going to be out in the world. Um, it will probably be a while if ever before I write another book, but <laughs> I'm just really, really proud of myself that I did it. And I'm really thankful to my wonderful editor, Daniela Wexler, as well as my agent, um, Aliyah Hannah Habib, who, you know, were very encouraging throughout this entire process. It's been uh, stressful, but also rewarding. And um, I'm excited for people to finally read it and and get what they get, whatever they get out of it. Um, that's that's the goal. Oh, that. I mean, I'm sure you're dealing with very different timelines for what you're usually writing as compared to a book, which I don't think people know how long it actually takes a book, even the writing, but even the publishing process on the back end. Yeah, for sure. I mean, this is definitely the longest I've ever worked on a single project, um, you know, for various things. Sometimes I've worked months. Uh, I think months is like the longest I've worked on something consistently. Um, and so this was, you know, from the first pitch of the, you know, the skeleton of this up until that final sort of going through all the edits and all of the copy editing and the, the fact checking and all that stuff. It was a good like two and a half years of my life. And I started just as the pandemic was happening. So um, you would think that I could have maybe finished it a little bit sooner, but I I'd actually never took any time off from work to do this. Uh, I still had my full time job at NPR. So um, yeah, it's <laughs> that maybe that's what I don't recommend. I don't recommend working full time while also trying to write a book on a deadline. It's just it's hard. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, that's so interesting. Um, well, you should be proud of yourself because it it's fantastic. And like I said, it's a, a series of essays. And I was immediately <clears throat> pulled in when it was first presented to us at HarperCollins, the team. I knew 
exactly from the name. Um, I love the name. Um, that it was going to be that 90s, 2000s culture that I love so much. Um, And in the book, you're able to take all of the social media and celebrity gossip and Disney adult nostalgia and have this really sharp, (laughs) insightful take on what it means for the grander world. Um, Kind of like, and I've told you this off um, recording, is that it like took all my random pop culture knowledge and put it in a way that I could think critically. And I so enjoyed that. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, I am one of those people who like almost always thinks in pop culture memes and excuse me and references. It's just, you know, if someone says something, it might take me to a song lyric. I I always think of like whenever someone says we're all in this together, all I can think of is High School Musical and (laughs) and all the kids um, who are dancing to High School Musical, like we're all in this together. Um, Yeah, no, it's I what I what I loved about writing the book was in in part being able to take all of the many random tangents and things and uh, movies and shows and musical references that I've kind of accumulated over my 30 plus years of life and apply them to how they've shaped me, how they've changed me, how they've affected me, how they've Um, affected other people and how we interact with one another. And that's like a big part of the book is, and the big crux of my thesis for this collection of essays is that like, even for those of us who might not even be that pop culturally inclined or who like maybe go to the movies once a year, like to an actual theater and like maybe don't even stream that many things at home, there's still no real possible way unless you somehow like grew up without watching tv or grew up you know in a very enclosed uh environment there's no way that any of us aren't touched by pop culture in some way and i think it's important for us to understand how it affects us and how it can often do so subconsciously without us even realizing it and how it affects how we actually see ourselves and how we put ourselves out in the world yeah yeah for sure Um, And I, too, think in High School Musical sounds, I just said, (laughs) what did I say yesterday? Oh, I was like, I want it all. You have to go into that song, too, right? Um, It is something (laughs) that that touches all us all in in somewhere or or another. Um, I would going a little bit to what you're saying, like, depending on how you grew up and what generations, I think a conversation we have at on my team, too, is like generationally what speaks to us versus, oh, I, you know, what I can learn from someone. And I think people put pop culture in a box of saying like, oh, I don't really get that because I didn't grow up with it. Um, Do you think there are trends or themes that transcend those generational gaps? Well, one one of the the essays in my book specifically touches on the, what I call the over-franchisification of everything in pop culture and how we are kind of in this cyclical uh, hamster wheel where we are just kind of seeing and regurgitating and being regurgitated to all of this pop culture from the past and how like we're slowly closing in and we're not even you know, we're not even done with a a previous trend before it comes back in a different form. Um, I kind of wish that I had written this a little bit later because just recently it was announced that Moana is getting a quote unquote live action remake already. It's been less than a decade since that movie came out. So, um, the, so I think that because we've kind of seen the shrinking of, uh, new properties and new things in pop culture, I definitely think that, there is an argument to be made that more than ever people are going to have similar references when it comes to a lot of pop culture, at least the things that sort of rise to the top, the things that are most promoted and and thrown into theaters and the marvelization of everything has definitely made it so that like you've got older people as well as younger people going to see the same movies. Um, But I also think there are just some things that even if they aren't sort of regurgitated in the same way um, are still going to transcend our understandings of and and transcend things that we enjoy. I think there are still like every few years, years there will be a high school movie, I think, that really kind of takes the idea of what high school movies used to be the 80s you know john hughes films and and like in the 90s films like she's all that and whatever and really put a fresh spin on it in a way that 
can appeal to both people who might be a little bit older and also kids who are actually high school age or around high school age now. And I think of something like Lady Bird, um, Greta Gerwig's really fantastic movie, which is one of my favorite movies of the last like decade or so that is just so it's set actually in the time period when I was also a teenager, Greta Gerwig's only like a couple years older than I am. And she sets it in like the early mid 2000s. And but it's very subtle. And it in many ways, I think, um, captures a very real and multi-generational uh, angst and ire, especially when it comes to how mothers and daughters relate to each other. So I definitely think there are there are always going to be things that regardless of how old you are and what time period you grew up in that are going to really translate across various generations. But I think it does get um, harder in part because my other tangent, my brief tangent here is that I also think that, you know, I grew up and I think a lot of millennials grew up the fir- the earliest pop culture we kind of di- like kind of came into and consumed was often through our parents. And I don't know about your parents, but my parents were always listening to the things they listened to when they were kids. So I heard a lot of Motown. I heard a lot of music from the 70s and 80s. Um, and, you know, I think I wonder if that's so true today, because there are like kids nowadays, they always have their headphones on at a, at a young age. They have their iPads. Spotify makes it really easy to not like you can just kind of listen to what you want to listen to and not discover new things. And so I do wonder, you know, is there is there a generational like is there a generation gap? Are kids now less likely to understand references from their past than, you know, we were as kids? But that's maybe a whole other conversation. Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to get off of this tangent, but <laughs> no, that's really <laughs> these interesting. are things I've been yeah, these are things I've been chewing over because, you know, I also just grew up on a steady diet of Nick at night and I love Lucy and Mary Tyler Moore show. Um, and I I don't know if kids are aware of these things today because cable is not really a thing anymore. Like I don't even have cable as an adult. So yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, no, that's interesting. I've never really thought of it in those terms that it's really what you surround yourself with too. Because like I knew about Carol Burnett, but I wasn't seeing it on TV. I was seeing because my parents showed me. So yeah, I guess right. those would transcend as well if your parents are putting in the work. I don't know. Interesting. Yeah. Um, well, and I loved Ladybird too. That that movie snuck on, up on me. I went in with no information at all and just came out weeping. It was so good. <laughs> um, speaking of time periods, this is, you know, 90s, 2000 culture in the book. Um, you know, hit or miss looking back, like what stands the test of time in that uh, time period. But I saw a tweet mm. that you had <laughs> tweeted the other day that said you were kind of embarrassed about having loved Gwen Stefani's Love Angel Music Baby CD when you were younger. And I was <laughs> no joke having that conversation with someone the other day. I was talking about one of the songs and I was like, that was in there. Why was I listening to that? Um, and so yeah. I don't know. Why are the 90s having this moment right now? Why do people want to go back to it? Oh, I mean, this is this is the natural progression of things. This is how time and nostalgia work, right? Um, you know, in the 90s, there was nostalgia for the 70s. I remember as a kid, first of all, the Spice Girls who, you know, want to be is partially in, in, in debt to their <laughs> to that wonderful song. Uh, and the Spice Girls were very 70s, disco-y adjacent, like, but in a 90s package. Um, there was a period where, uh, I don't know if you remember on VH1, where they had like, I love the 70s, I love the 80s. And, and this was in the late 90s and early aughts that we were we were seeing those things filter through. So I think it's only natural. It seems like every 20 to 30 years, uh, you get that nostalgia for the previous 20 to 30 years. Um, but it does seem like it's getting a little like the time is shrinking again to sort of reiterate my earlier point. Um, and another point I, I a reference I make in the uh, book is this onion article about <laughs> the uh, how time like nostalgia is just kind of getting it's shrinking we're running out of time because 
we're no longer being nostalgic for like 20 years before. Now we're being nostalgic for like five or 10 years before, like for the end of the 90s, before the 90s are even over. And it's so crazy to think how true that still is and how, you know, now there are, I go out and I see 19, 20 year olds dressing like I did when I was 19 or 20 years old, like in the mid aughts. And it's very strange and weird. Yeah. Um, halter tops and chokers and <laughs> and like, uh, yeah, it's it's uh it's it's quite a weird thing to to realize. Yeah, it's. <laughs> I think it's just the natural progression of things. This is why we are so interested in sort of rehashing and looking back at the '90s and the aughts now because enough time has passed, and we're also just reassessing the way we responded to those things, whether it's Janet Jackson at the Super Bowl or Britney Spears or Pamela Anderson, like we're we're just always kind of reflecting in in cycles of like 20 and sometimes 10 years. <laughs> True. So I was saying that this book really made me contemplate things and a lot of these essays stayed with me for a really long time. And I was I was just I was telling other friends about it. Um and I spent a lot of time mulling over uh, the the one in chapter two. Um, it was like how to criticize black art. And you do a great job of capturing mm -hmm. nostalgia and progression, but also this really suffocating scope of discourse that we have in pop culture. Um, there's always someone anti antagonizing on both sides. But what is the best way to cut out noise when you are evaluating something um, that means something to you and does nuance and your opinion, those are always fighting, right? Like, I don't know if yeah. you have any tips for like thinking critically when you come to, when it comes to pop culture. Yeah. I mean, when I first started out, first realized I wanted to do this kind of work of reviewing and critiquing and writing about film and TV in particular, I definitely was coming at it from this sort of social social justice-y perspective where I felt like I needed to, A, focus on Black film and TV, which I still do, and I think it's important to because they deserve attention, but to be also to also like really focus on like whether it's quote unquote a positive depiction of black people or a negative one and not so much on like the art itself. And over time, I was able to sort of like learn that that's a very stifling way to think about art. And, and one of the things that I sometimes, and sometimes I do, depending on the work of art or the, the thing that I am assessing, I sometimes can still kind of fall into that trap. And I have to be very conscious of when it's happening and also question myself. And I think that's the first thing I always try and impart upon people is like, always question your thoughts. Um, because I think that for me, I also want to get to like, how did this actually make me feel? How did this, uh, like, uh, Everything aside, whether it's politically correct or not, whether it feels like this is, you know, saying aligns with my my values as a progressive liberal who, you know, wants, you know, to see good and complicated depictions of Black people on screen and have that work come also from Black artists who are complex and, and different, um, you know, but also how does this make me feel and how, like, do I think aside from all that, is it working? Is it doing what it set out to do, whatever that is, uh, creatively, aesthetically? Um, and I think being able to find that balance is always going to be the challenge of talking about any kind of art, but especially for me, uh, talking about Black art. And just always being aware that it's just not enough <laughs> it's not enough for me to feel as though this movie is necessarily saying the right thing. Um, if that, if I don't think it's a good movie or if I don't think that it's working on an artistic level, I feel like I should be able to say that and say that without, in a way that is um, not to tear down other Black art necessarily, but to also just say, you know, and I say this in the book, like Black art is not fragile and it shouldn't be treated as such. Like, I don't need to assess it with kid kid gloves on, and I don't want to do that. I want to treat it just as I would 
any other piece of art. And I think that's that to me is where progress happens. Like that's how things get better. You know, it's Sidney Poitier was great. I'm glad he existed. And he, even he at some point got sick of being the sort of like perfect black male figure who like was supposed to unite everyone under this guise of like the the ex- exceptional negro um and i use that you know in air quotes because that was sort of the the term that was used during his time um and you know in the 70s he kind of took the reins and was making more interesting films as a director um and so i think that it's just important to not limit ourselves when we talk about black art and really not just focus on the positive and the the negative, but also focus on like, okay, is this actually good? (laughs) Is it entertaining? Does it, does it move you? Does it make you feel something? Um, Because there's so much art about black people and or made by black people that is not moving. And, and it may be like, you know, it may be saying all the right things, whatever that means to you, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's like actually fun to watch or like thought provoking in any way. Yeah. I love that line in the book about it not being fragile. Um, and I, I think the joy is in the, the read of that essay. I don't want to give too much away, but I, I am so glad you just said that because that was my favorite line. Um, Mm -hmm. and I think that those things, what you're saying is that it's just not mutually exclusive, you know, like it can be Mm -hmm. a wonderful thing, but you can like not feel something as well. Anyway, it was just, I'm still thinking about it and I think it has changed me a little. So thank you for writing about that. Um, Oh, I wanted to ask you kind of a fun question. Is there, you said you think in pop culture references, is there a trend or a meme that you think sums up your writing experience when writing or publishing this book? Uh, There's like this, if you're on Twitter for any amount of time, well, there's two that comes to mind, and they're both like funny enough, Jim Henson uh, adjacent. The first is that like meme of Elmo looks like they're raising their arm and they look crazy, like gah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and then there's another with Kermit where it's like a gif where he's furiously typing on a typewriter and just like his whole body is moving with it. I feel like that was. <laughs> <laughs> Those two were kind of my my uh, my experiences of like going feeling as like feeling uh, out of out of control and also just like furiously <laughs> typing a lot. <laughs> I love that. I love it. Yes. Uh, and you just recorded the audio book. I don't know if you want to talk about that experience. Was yeah. it a different? I don't know. What do you think people will get listening versus reading the book? Well. When, I will say the dis, the most the only disappointing thing about recording the audiobook is that my book obviously is filled with tons of pop culture references. And there are some, you know, song lyrics and things that like I was hoping to be able to sing because I do have a musical theater background. I love karaoke and I was like, I'm excited for this. But because we do not have the rights to the melodies of those songs, I could not sing them. Uh, so that was an interesting experience to to deal with. But like I do get to do voices. Um, I do my best impression of Dave Chappelle, who pops up for a little bit in the book. Um, I don't know how good it is, but I tried. <laughs> so stay for that if you're if you're interested in hearing me attempt a Dave Chappelle uh voice and um yeah I think there's just like there's always some of my favorite audiobooks have been the ones that are read by the writers themselves um I think of Tina Fey's book um which was just fun to hear her voice in in part because you're familiar with her voice and Look, I'm, I'm not Tina Fey. I'm not on her level. But, you know, enough people, if you are an NPR listener and if you like PCHH and like me, then <laughs> it, it would be a treat to listen to this because it's just me for a few hours. <laughs> so, yeah, that was that was fun. No, I was going to say they know your voice. So, I mean, I I'm going to disagree. I think, you know, yeah. Um, <laughs> much like Tina Fey, they're going to know your voice and they're going to want to hear in your own words. I agree. There's some books that it's it's the best when the, um, especially nonfiction, when the author reads it themselves. Um, yeah. And so that's a good segue 
to music rights, you have made a playlist for us. I did. Yes. It's a journey. Um, and it's interesting. So it's on Spotify. Um, I'm sure we can provide a link for everyone. Um, but it basically, you know, it's actually something you could easily listen to while reading the book. It goes in order sort of of how things show up and not everything that's on this list is actually makes an appearance in the book, but I, I, they are like, it includes things that at least inspired the, the chapters in the book. Um, so there's, there's some, <laughs> there's some Kenny G on there, but only because uh, it's relevant to the book, not because I am actually a fan. I actually have very strong feelings about Kenny G, not the man, but just the music, uh, <laughs> which you will find out about if you read the book. Um, of course, there's some Spice Girls. There is some Disney, including Circle of Life. There's Beyonce. There's Julie Depley. De there's Julie Delpy from the Before Sunrise, Before Sunset trilogy, which I, there's just, if you haven't seen those movies, they go watch them. But they are, to me, the one, one of the few exceptions to the rule about uh, sequels and, and franchises being terrible. I love that series. I think it's beautiful. Um, yeah, it's, it's kind of, it's, it's all over the place. Um, I'm trying to think of what like the most obscure song is on here. Probably Santa Claus is a black man, uh, which is this like very, this novelty song from I think the seventies or the eighties. Uh, and that ties into a piece in my book, uh, where I kind of discuss this uh, bizarre viral moment that I had almost a decade ago where um, a certain Fox News host got mad at me for suggesting that Santa Claus could be a penguin instead of uh, an old white man. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, mm -hmm. the playlist is great. I mean, and also, you know, your two songs that you mentioned in the beginning of the book when you're talking about your name. And that was a great chapter as well. Um, cause that I have to say, I was like, Oh, I have to bring that up while I'm listening. So the playlist is great for that. So you can just listen along. Yeah. There, yes. There's Stevie wonder and, uh, a top 10 billboard hit from the early nineties called Aisha that, uh, again, read the book. You will know, <laughs> <laughs> you will know how that all ties together. <laughs> yes. I love it. That should be the headline in any, anything. See how these two things tie together and, and bring them in. <laughs> Yeah, I have lots of mood boards and lots of like various photos and things that may seem random on their surface, but are actually, they actually make all the difference and make, make sense in context. Love it. Yeah, I was diving into some things on your website, which you have a great like where to start section for things you mm -hmm. created, which I, everyone should go check out. Um, but you have screening ourselves um, which was a section of Pop Culture Happy Hour, I think three episodes. I'm not sure if there's more. Um, yes, there were three. Yep, there were three. Okay, so three episodes. And you, you know, it kind of ties into what we're talking about in the book, these dismissive tropes or things we need to look at a different way from the past that either are being, you know, reevaluated or changed. Um, and in chapter five, you, you have rewrites of uh, black characters on tv shows and how they would react um and i thought that was really great um so how is this reevaluation of older tv media and movies crucial to our growth as a society in pop culture i know it's a very big question <laughs> <laughs> well um screening ourselves was a limited series i did um that fell under the pch umbrella and it was actually kind of a departure from the format of our show, which is usually just kind of like a conversation about, about the latest movies and TV. Um, and Screening Ourselves was my chance to sort of put on my academic nerd hat and really dive into narrative storytelling. So it was my first time actually writing a script for audio. And each essay or each uh, episode was focused on an old movie that was uh, that represented a different demographic and looked at the ways that these demographics that they were supposed to represent uh, responded to them. And these are all in some way either like cult or like considered certified classics. So the first episode was about Godfather. 
second one was about basic instinct, and the third was about the color purple. And so um, with all of those, I was looking at how the reactions in real time at, at those times uh, amongst both activists and critics and just like media folks about how Italian Americans were represented, uh, Black men and Black women and queer queer people were on screen with basic instinct. And what I wanted to do with those and what I think is important when we talk about sort of going back and looking at things that were especially popular things at the time is to kind of understand how these conversations are still happening. Just like how much time has passed and how much time hasn't really passed in terms of how we assess these things. And so, so many of the issues that I was coming across while talking about these films is that, yeah, I mean, things have gotten better in many ways, especially for queer representation and uh, Black female representation in pop culture. But not really. Like, we're, we're still, like, you could see the threads of, like, the conversations around The Color Purple and how Black men were largely upset about the film and how they were seen, um, considering that all the Black men in the movie, for the most part, are abusive in some way towards the Black women in their lives. And how that really stirred up a lot of conversation at the time. And in that episode, I tied it to the conversations happening now around artists like Megan Thee Stallion and the fact that her court case around being shot by a, a former friend of hers, a, a Black man, and how that kind of showed that there are still a lot, there's still a lot of misogyny um, and misogynoir that occurs in the same way that we were talking about it when The Color Purple was first release as a film 30 plus years ago, almost 40 years ago now. So I think it's really important to look back on the past because you can kind of understand how far you've come and, and then how far we still need to go. Um, and that's also the crux in many ways of the things that I'm talking about in this book and, and how, you know, there are, you know, so many ways that pop culture reflects the attitudes of of whatever whatever time we are in and we've seen it in politics we've seen it in just everything that's happening outside of pop culture like the more things change the more things stay the same and that's equally true of our pop culture um although i do think our pop culture is a little bit further along than the rest of our the way we do things but some would say not as much, not that much, you know. <laughs> true, true. And our pop culture gives a lot of platforms for, I mean, if you're not on Fox News telling everyone, um, mm -hmm. a lot of space for people to say things behind screens, which is unfortunate. Yes. Yeah. 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 Wow. Well, this has been fantastic. I have about 20 million other questions written down, but I think we're almost out of time. We will bid adieu, but thank you so much for writing this book and for taking some time to talk to librarians today. Um, a reminder that it comes out on June 13th. If you're a librarian, you can go get an e-galley now so you can get to reading and please email me so we can talk about it. <laughs> um, thank you, Aisha. <laughs> thank you. It's been such a pleasure. And then we have a little behind the scenes uh, recording after our last Writers to Watch that featured, um, and you'll hear them in this order as they begin to talk. We have Lena Andrews, author of Valiant Women, Kim Van Alcamada, who wrote Counting Lost Stars. Then we have Mona Susan Power, author of The Council of Dolls. And then we have Jennifer Chiaverini, author of Canary Girls. Um, so listen to that and then you can go watch the full thing in the show notes or on our YouTube channel. Um, Lena, I have a question for you, if we don't mind starting there. Could you talk a little bit more about, um, you know, so you had a lot of modalities of research. You used archival research, interviews, oral histories, other academic writings. Um, did you have like a favorite way of researching. Um, maybe talk a bit more about the interviews because I I loved reading about those. Yeah. No. Well, thank you for asking. I'm as a social scientist. I'm like, oh, you want to hear about my research? Of course, I'll tell you all about it. Um, 
but I'll keep it as interesting as I possibly can. Like you said, it's, it's sort of triangulating among different things. And I think with histories like this, as many as everyone on the screen probably understands, you get bits and pieces. Um, and so it's a lot of it is really hard. The burden of verification can be really difficult. Um, adding to that, the lockdown issues is really challenging, right? So, um, you know, the archival stuff had to wait. I actually reversed my research process. Process. I did the interviews first, which I would have done second, and my archives, you know, uh, second, which I would have done first. Um, so two sort of funny stories from that. On the archival side, which I think many librarians will appreciate, I had some of the most patient archivists in the world who would go pull the files for me and then sit on Zoom and flip through individual pages wow. as I read them and took notes. Or they would digitize them and send me hundreds of pages of files. So they were just truly among you know the I call them sort of the stewards of our national history and I that is I could not agree with them more they just have found these gems for me um, and I think because they were maybe a little bored they would find these really cool things and send them to me so I loved interacting with them it was so fun and they are just brilliant um, researchers and thinkers and it was so great to interact with them but the, I have to say the greatest joy was um, interviewing I was able to interview several living veterans um, my youngest was 98. My oldest was 106. Um, they all successfully navigated Zoom with me, <laughs> which is a testament, which keeps me inspired. As Kim mentioned, you know, I'm like, you know, computers and technology feels very foreign, but if they can do it, we all can. Um, and it, it was just um, so fun because at this point in their lives, I think most people hadn't ask them about it. It was often, you know, the first time they had been asked about it in a really long time. Um, and they had nothing to lose, you know, so I have these amazing videos of these incredible women who were really frank about their experiences. Um, and in one case, I was actually able to go in person because she lived nearby. She's actually since passed away. She's an incredible woman um, who lived in veteran who lived in Columbia, Maryland, um, Miss B, uh, who served basically the community for the rest of her life. Um, but they were just so delightful to talk to and so fun and so funny, so funny. Um, you know, imagine talking to your grandmother. <laughs> She's great, you know. Um, some were pretty tough, but uh, but they just brought so much joy to this project. Um, and uh, you know, there was a little sadness, a little tinge of sadness, a lot of emails I got back said, you know, my aunt or my grandma can't really talk, she's not in good health, or she doesn't have the memory. Um, so when I exhort people to ask questions and listen to the people in their lives, particularly the older people in their lives, um, I really mean it. And this experience prompted me to go back to my uncles who had served in the military and ask them questions about their service, um, which I elicited so much amazing, rich information. And if you can record it, um, you'll, you won't regret it in 10 years, I promise. Um, so it was just such a joy. And the interviews really brought so much of this to life as hopefully readers will see. Yeah. Oral histories are really just this like priceless gem. It, one of the things I was able to do just before the pandemic, October 2019, my partner and I went to the Netherlands. One of the reasons I set so much of my novel in the Netherlands, because my father was born in Rotterdam and lived mm -hmm. through the, the bombing and the occupation. And so I went to, we went to interview my aunt, who's in her 90s. And not only does she remember anything, everything, she, she could tell me everything in English because they're all so brilliant. And um, it was, like you said, it it makes things so personal and so real. And another inspiration for the novel was that my father's family is not Jewish, but their neighbors in the same house were. And so my dad and his sisters witnessed their neighbors being arrested and deported kind of helplessly, you know, and it affected them deeply. And uh, to hear that, you know, from my aunt and to, for her to tell me about it was really powerful. Wow. Along those lines, uh, something I'm very glad I did. Um, you know, when you're younger, sometimes our parents can drive us crazy. We're like, oh, yeah, I don't need to hear that story again. And then, but um, and my my mom lived to be nine, lived to be 98 years old. And about the last 15 years or so of her life, I started asking her questions about stories she had told me so that I could type down, you know, all of the details um, because she had such an incredible memory. Um, for specific details. And um, so now there's this treasure trove I have mm. that I can go back and um, just of the Khoda history going back um, from the late 1800s all the way through to the her contemporary times. So 
Jennifer, I wanted to ask you, is there anything that in your research particularly surprised you or that you were surprised to learn? I learned a lot in your book. I was just taken aback by reading the stories of the Munichnet. So I'd love to hear more about, you know, some of you came across your research that was like, whoa. Oh, there are so, so many things. Um, you know, it would be hard to pick just one that was a big surprise because it was all such a wonderful learning experience. And I, I think um, one of the things that I don't know if it was a surprise, but one of the things that I think perhaps moved me the most was learning about how some of the working conditions that the women came from, because a lot of them were entering the workforce for the first time, and it wasn't something they intended to do forever. It was just something they wanted, you know, they wanted to do to contribute to the war effort and because they understood every day, you know, every day they can move their country toward victory is a day closer to peace, you know, fewer men killed on the battlefield a day sooner that their loved ones can come home. But some of these women had come from really arduous working conditions. And I think the life of the women who worked in domestic service. Now, of course, some places, some employers were better than others. But you heard me talk a little bit about how difficult the working conditions were in these factories. For some of the women who came from domestic service, this was a big step up. They had more time off. Their shifts were shorter. And so, you know, when they hear about, oh, they only have to work a seven hour shift. Oh, this is great. Sign me up. Um, and, and, I, and I just marveled at that, that the existing normal women's work was so difficult and so demanding and in some ways so demeaning that it was just a revelation to go into this factory work that, you know, I, as a 21st century woman, would look at and say, this is incredibly dangerous. Give them a longer lunch break. Give them weekends off, you know, because all of these privileges, that all these rights that we have now. Um, and just to hear, I think I was really moved by how for many of the women, yes, it was service to their country, but it was also this enormous step forward in their independence. It took a devastating, terrible war just to give them a sense of that. And then once they had it, they were not going to let it go. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I always think of that as coming along more in World War II, but really all of that important groundwork was laid during in the UK during during World War One when they stepped up when their country needed them. So much of what you just remarked on, I think, is the experience, particularly for women of color in World War II. So the it was an explicit part of the sort of marketing campaign, not just to women of color, but communities of color in World War II, that this was not just an opportunity to address head on the sort of great um, disappointment that Black men and women could be sent abroad to fight for freedom at home when they didn't have it in the United States. But also, this was an opportunity to move out, particularly for women and women of color, of the sort of domestic positions that they had been relegated to for so long, because suddenly you were being promised a skill. I think for, you know, communities of color in World War II, especially women of color, this was a huge, huge um, benefit of serving, um, in addition to sort of the moral and uh, philosophical and existential thing, which overwhelmingly um, was the motive, but there was also that silver lining of it. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then there was a, Mona, I don't know, we didn't really talk as much about the speculative dolls and, and the story told through them. Someone asked why you chose to tell, frame it through the stories, through the dolls. I have to be really honest. Um, I didn't choose that. <laughs> I really am a very intuitive writer and I feel like I don't have a lot of choice. Just as I mentioned, I was working on another novel when, yeah, no, this was the one that wanted to be born at the particular time it was born. Um, and so the way that the, the seed for that, that whole book started as a short story that was written as a standalone story. Um, I actually was trying to write something really sweet and loving, inspired by um, the warm moments with my mom. We, we had a very difficult relationship in many ways, but I adored her. 
and it just turned it went a whole different direction the story and um you know and and ethel my doll from childhood just showed up as this character who was just going to protect her girl at all costs and um and so i wrote that short story and i sent it off and it was um published in the missouri review and um and about a year later a friend of mine read it and she's african american and she said there could be a whole novel about ethel and black protectiveness <clears throat> I was like novel, <laughs> novel. And so I was thinking I would write a novel just set in my time, the time period I was familiar with growing up in the sixties. And then something said, oh wait, remember that story about your mother and how the only doll she ever had because they were very, very, very poor. And it was given to her by like a mission lady. Um, she had a, a friend, a young friend who was dying of tuberculosis and she was asked to give her doll to this friend and she was a very generous person, but it was hard for her to give up that doll, but she did. And the doll was buried with the little girl. And so, you know, that, that, so then I'm thinking, oh, let's put another generation. And so it kind of, so really the answer is there, there was no choice. The dolls just showed up and this, oh gosh, in May, the Shirley Temple doll, she's a talker. <laughs> like just, I felt like I was taking dictation, like, okay, there's, oh, there's more. Oh, Okay. Uh, so anyway, she's a Hollywood doll, with, you know. So, <laughs> oh, it's lovely. And then, also, we're going to hear a snippet of a interview with the editorial director of Harper Via. We had Juan Mila on our Gally Gab Fest event this month, and we thought we'd just do a little snippet here so you can get a taste for a couple books, a little book buzz. And then you can go listen to the rest and see images of all these books on our Facebook, YouTube, wherever the videos are in our archive uh, and in the show notes. Fantastic. Thank you again. Um, so Harper Via. Harper Via is a um, relatively new imprint at HarperCollins. It was created I think five years ago now. I think we've had four years of publishing books. And uh, it was, uh, it's, it's the brainchild of, of Judith Kerr when she started the Harper One group at HarperCollins, uh, which comprises the Harper One eponymous imprint in San Francisco and HarperCollins Espanol and Amistad. And she wanted to do fiction in a different way. Um, different books done differently. And she had had uh, experience with translation uh, before, so uh, we thought of this imprint that is focused on international books. This is a, a kind of a wide term of, of comprising uh, both books written in English and translated from other languages, but all coming from different parts of the world um, and using what uh, the novel can do so well, which is allow us to connect through imagination and empathy with other ways of seeing the world and being in the world. And uh, it, it includes pretty much everything. And it, the, the, the choices we have are so wonderful. Um, there are so many wonderful storytellers and so wonderful stories out there that uh, don't get to be read here. So we have a, a choice of so many uh, wonderful, wonderful books. Uh, and we're looking for books that are original and books that are authentic and uh, that are culturally relevant. So, you know, we're not interested in kind of more of more of the same, but of looking for the ones that are truly special. I, I love hearing authors um, read books in their own language. I think there's something really special about that. And in general, I think like translation is such an art and I feel like some of my favorite books that I read this year were from um, Harper Via, including um, Walking Practice by Joel Kimin. Mm -hmm. I, that book that went on sale in January and it was just phenomenal. And I think part of it was the fact that it was translated. I don't think it would have been the same. Well, that's so wonderful to hear. <laughs> that's uh, that's uh, the idea behind uh, the imprint that uh, there's all kinds of books here, all kinds of exciting books. And that translation is just one dimension of them, but not uh, what makes them uh, what they are. You know, it's it's just something else, and it's it's great to see 
uh, translation uh, being increasingly more visible um, everywhere and 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 literary translators uh, getting recognized and and getting awards um, Emily Balistrieri in the first video who translated the the two the Tami books Tami Galaxy and the sequel um, was in town recently because she was a finalist for the Penn Translation Award, which is a big deal. And um, it's been amazing uh, to see translators uh, get recognition and, and get uh, the work they do uh, as, as kind of writers because they need to find the way to, to rewrite the book in English. So. It's not a mechanical thing. It's more like an artistic. Like a puzzle. Yes, it is, it is very much like a puzzle. Uh, and they are always such interesting partners for us. They know um, of interesting books, of interesting writers. Uh, they understand the what the challenges in any book or any project are and uh, are incredibly helpful to us. A great community. So do we want to talk about uh, some of the books from uh, some of the highlights from the forthcoming list that you are pretty jazzed about and Grace put the jackets up there. So we want to just talk briefly about them or just sure. yeah, highlight Absolutely. them. Yeah. Ooh, my husband, uh, really excited about this one. Uh, this is a French novel uh, that uh, Gretchen Schmidt, who's, a, who's an editor at Harper Via, uh, brought with her actually uh, when she was hired. Um, and uh, this is a really original French novel. Uh, it's a story about a wife obsessed with her husband. This is a French wife who lives in the outskirts of Paris, two children. And chapter after chapter, she goes into detail, deep into her obsession with being the perfect wife. And you can, you can uh, sense from the beginning that there's something strange and off and wrong uh, in, that, in, in, in the story and how she tells it. And uh, I think uh, the author does a, an amazing job of keeping you hooked chapter after chapter until a big reveal at the end uh, in this sort of suspenseful um, story of obsession that feels extremely French and extremely rich culturally and yet completely universal and uh, close to many uh, sort of similar books of that su uh, suspense genre. Um, I read that book in two sittings and mm -hmm. I I don't know what I was expecting because I I mean obviously it was one of those like has a big surprise so I think that's why the, the copy was short which I'm mm -hmm. glad it was because that was quite the ending I it was just nothing that I expected in the best way right and at the time 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 Machine Blues. Uh, this is uh, the second book by Tomihiko Morimi that we're publishing after the Tatami Galaxy. You know? uh, a book by, uh, I mean, uh, edited by Alexa Frank, who is an editor at Harper Via, who reads Japanese, uh, which is um, also something that I didn't mention, and it's important to us. Um, many of us. Uh, read at least another language. Uh, we consider sort of linguistic diversity to be important for this kind of, of line of work because we want to read fast and we want to really uh, understand the nuances of the works in their original language. And Alexa could not believe that uh, the Tomiko Morimi books, which uh, are... Uh, very, very widely read uh, in Japan and in, in other countries and have inspired a big anime series had not been translated into English. So um, 
she was able to acquire these two wonderful books, get them translated by a wonderful translator. And uh, they're out there. The first book is out in the world doing really well, uh, a finalist for the Pen Translation Award. And uh, again, this is perfect Japanese pop um, writing, uh, you know, joyfully positive literary writing, but also magnetic and magical in a way. It's uh, These books are really special. This one, uh, again, has the, the different sort of labyrinths and uh, alternative realities that the um, protagonists navigate. Uh, so fun, very culturally relevant. If you're interested in things Japanese uh, and manga, this is the book. Love it. A lot of interest for oh this oh my god tongues are wagging for this book this is so exciting too maybe and the birth of Frankenstein this has been such a fun book to edit uh, ever since I started working on this book I see Frankenstein and monsters everywhere I look everywhere I turn it's uh, no wonder that this uh, uh, story this ghost story written. Um, more than 200 years ago, is still um, captivating us. It really touches on, on something um, that feels uh, very, very much about the human nature um, and uh, our imagination. So this is uh, Anne uh, Eckhout, uh, who is in the video reading the first sentence of the book, is a Dutch author. She's published uh, four or five books, four books, I think. And she's an award-winning author in, in, in Holland and, uh, and a you know, true storyteller where every book is different and she's a, she's a natural storyteller. And she was visiting the John Keats Museum in Rome when she read something about the story of Mary Shelley, before she wrote Frankenstein, a time she spent in in Scotland with some family friends, and that sparked something. And she decided to tell this very English story um, through her Dutch eyes, and it's just a, a, a wonderful story. Uh, this is two times; it, it, it's very cleverly structured and paced. Um, one is the time we all know when during one summer, Mary Shelley and, and uh, Percy Shelley and Lord Byron were all sitting around the um, fire at the, the just long nights in Geneva in a big house in a very rainy summer. And Lord Byron came up with the idea of asking everyone to write a ghost story. And we know that Mary's story was Frankenstein. And she goes back to four years before that, when she spent a summer in Scotland with, with some friends of family as a young 14-year-old. And she became friends and eventually became infatuated with this young woman her age. Uh, and they both sort of experience uh, this... Uh, their anxieties about, um, I guess, growing up in a way, and their fears, and they, they, they have, they share their nightmares and they, their kind of visions of monsters that they, they're not sure whether they are or not, and it's not entirely clear whether one of the characters is truly a monster. Um, but anyway, you keep turning the pages, and I, I think I'm talking too much about it, but it's just because I. Um, I, I love this novel so much. This is this was a really special book. I mean, I, I uh, she was Mary Shelley was asked to write an introduction to the second edition of the book in 1831, and one of the things she felt she needed to to respond to was the question of how could someone so young like you write. A, a ghost story so powerful like where did that come from so she goes a little bit into that and it's really 
quite quite fascinating. I mean, she was yeah. she was very young, but also extremely well read and talented. It's funny because I love you were saying that Frankenstein really captures us even today after all of these years. But what's funny to me is it was kind of written on a dare. She was told <laughs> to make up this story, but all of these authors afterwards, like this author who had an idea that flared, like they're kind of doing the same thing. And I, I love that it keeps going. Yes. Uh, yes. I, I'm, I mean, don't get me started. Uh, I think that <laughs> because it, it, it touches on imagination, which is actually what, what keeps us alive in a way and human because we can imagine what, um, what moves us, what uh, we're afraid of, what uh, everything comes from this, that this kind of light that that drives us. Yeah. I love it. Thank you so much again. And thank you to everyone watching. Uh, thank you for your interest. And bye-bye. Thank you for listening to the Library Love Fest podcast. For more information, go to librarylovefest.com. Enjoying the show? We would love to hear what you think. Find us on Facebook and Twitter at Library Love Fest, on Instagram and TikTok at Harper Library. And you can always give us a call and leave us a message. You might end up on the show. That number is 212-207-7773. Be sure to rate and review us and share the show with a friend. Until next time.